Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. I'm your host, Richie Billing, and today I am thrilled to be joined by one of the legends of the fantasy genre, Juliet E. McKenna. Juliet has written over 20 novels and in recent years has, has been well known for the brilliant Green Man series. But today, Juliet's joining me to chat about her brand new book, The Cleaving, which is a retelling of the Arthurian legend from the perspective of the female characters that featured in the story. I've been reading the book. I've been enjoying it an awful lot. And it's a really, really interesting spin on what has classically been a very male dominated story. As well as talking about the book, we also talk about writing generally. Juliet has been in the game for over 20 years. She's gained an awful lot of insights and she's more than happy to share them with us, which is what we, what we appreciate more than anything. We also chat about world building, the publishing industry and the writing process as a whole. I'm sure you're going to find something very helpful in that discussion. But before we get to that, just a quick reminder that if you haven't already done so, to subscribe or follow the show so you don't miss any new episodes. We've got, got a cracking bunch of interviews lined up for the next few weeks and months. So if you don't want to miss any, hit that subscribe button and then you'll get a notification every time a new episode goes live. If you're really enjoying what we're doing, then please give us a rating on the Spotify mobile app or a quick review on iTunes. This helps not only new people find the show, but it tells us that we're doing something right and we're going to keep on doing it if that's the case. And um, if you'd also like to help us, a, a quick share on social media or with anyone you think may be interested goes an awful, awful long way. So thank you very much if you do that. If you'd like to join our writing community, then click the link in the description. You can find hundreds of writers to connect with to discuss ideas, get feedback on stories, or join a weekly writing group, which is something that uh, has been kicking off an awful lot in our writing community in the last few weeks, and is um, something we're going to be focusing on in a future episode. We're going to be inviting some people from the groups to chat about their experiences and how it's helped their writing. Now it's time to get on with the show, and here is the brilliant Juliet E. McKenna. I'm delighted to be joined by legendary fantasy author Juliet E. McKenna. Juliet, welcome to the show. Hello, very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for joining me. I know you've been very busy with a new book, The Cleaving, coming out very soon. Yes, um, I have to say the Angry Robot publicity team are playing an absolute blinder. Um, I've been talking to all sorts of people about all sorts of things. It's been great fun. Oh, and uh, they very kindly sent me a coffee as well, and I'm very much hooked. Um, lots of twists and turns at the end of each chapter, and I absolutely love the characters. Um, is it? I pronounce it Nimway in my mind. Is that how you... I, I pronounce it Nimway? Yeah, Nimway is a brilliant character, and it's, it's you know, I don't know if you ever watched it back when I was younger. I used to love the TV show Merlin, and it was, I suppose, it was a bit more relatable because you've got this younger character who's try is having to hide his magic, and Nimway is a bit like that. Yeah, Lots, um, I yeah. I love the um, TV show Merlin. Um, yeah, I've uh, and one of the things that I really liked about that retelling compared to others, because um, I'm I'm old. My fantasy TV work viewing goes back to Robin of Sherwood um, and Hawk the Slayer. But that's probably best left in the dark. <laughs> and one of the things about the TV Merlin I really liked was they got back to the swords and sorcery. Um, the magic, the mystery, um, yeah, within the format of a you know, yeah. TV show, which, let's face it, was basically ham- ca- uh, Camelot the high school years. Yeah. Uh, no, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, because one of the things about, um, yeah, we've had a lot of searching for the historical Arthur retellings, both in film and TV and in books. And that's interesting. I, yeah, I studied classics at university and... There are a lot of interesting questions around that, but I had absolutely nothing to bring to that particular debate. Yeah. But there were other areas of the Arthurian cycle that I wanted to explore. Um, though, to be fair, it wouldn't actually have occurred to me um, unless till I had a conversation with Simon Spanton Walker at Angry Robot, um, who was sort of thought about you know, um, writing Arthurian tale jewels. <laughs> and if anyone was at a fantasy con in Stafford, probably 
oh 15 20 years ago but probably now um they will have heard me say i moderated a panel about our theory and retellings and challenged the uh rest of the panel you know please explain why you're re rewriting the arthurian story because we know how it ends and it's not well yeah and i you know i there, i have issues with a lot of the way that the arthurian mythos is presented because i think it's at the root of a lot of the more outdated elements that have carried on through into a lot of epic fantasy and yeah. aren't necessarily interrogated looked at as much as they might be basically the you know big white knight on the big white horse rescuing the damsel in distress just yeah reduce it um and as i also said to simon well no because you know overarching patriarchy great culture toxic masculinity how many reasons do you need and simon said oh excellent i beg your pardon <laughs> um and we got talking and about how you could look at the arthurian mythos from a female-centered perspective yeah and i thought about that and i went away and i looked at the source material again and one of the things that struck me was in most of the classic retellings the women come into the, the action when they are doing something to further the plot, having something done to them to further the plot. And once their function as a plot coupon has been used, they go off stage. Yeah. And presumably sit in a cupboard. But actually, if you start drawing up a timeline, you start to look, see where these women will, will have overlapped, where they will have known each other, where they will have been in the same places. And one of the things about women... We talk to each other. And once I started thinking along those lines, all sorts of fascinating possibilities um, appeared. And also, one of the things about going back and reading the source material, particularly Thomas Mallory, um, the Mort Darthur, however you did pronounce that, there are magic swords all over the place. There are strange places. There are no earthly realms. There are female sorcerers. And I thought, yeah, OK, there's a lot I can get to grips with here. And I had yeah. great fun doing that. Oh, well, you can really tell. Like, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't feel because it is set in the sort of historical setting, isn't it? Uh, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels a lot more magical. It's it, it just grabbed me straight away. And I think I mentioned to you before we started, I really bad for getting drawn into books. And I'm so grateful when a, a book does hook me. And the story is just packed with so much action. And it's the characters are so interesting. Like, I think your portrayal of Merlin is a really interesting one. Like, he's he seems very flawed. He's got this belief that he's, I'm guessing it comes from his, his magical abilities and his, his ability to sort of foretell the future. Um, that he sort of feels that he has to follow this noble path but he, at the same like Nimue is a great sort of counterbalance to that by pointing out the stupidity of the things that he's doing <laughs> well, one, of, one of the most dangerous things in the world is someone who is convinced they're doing things for everybody else's yeah, good definitely. or the greater good um in a lot of ways um i mean this took me back i you know i started out writing epic fantasy swords and sorcery i'm better known these days for the green man books but back in 1999 my first novel the thief's gamble was a absolutely uh straight down the middle swords and sorcery epic fantasy and one of the drivers behind that plot was the question why don't wizards rule the world well there are various reasons why they don't in those books the tales of anarin but actually, one of the things when I was looking at Merlin and what he does, again, looking at um, what he does through the core thread of the Arthurian mythos. Yeah, basically, the same question applies to him. Yeah. And this book offers some answers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's brilliant. It's, like, it, it's um, I think your portrayal of Uther is a really great one as well. One scene in particular, I'm not going to mention it um, because it'll give it away. But um, I think he sort of he just came across as such a villainous person, uh, well, and again, it's sort of it sort of, he seems to sort of feed off Merlin's sort of belief in himself. And is, one of the is, things when you again going back and reading the source material, particularly Geoffrey of Monmouth, 
um, and you look at what the uses are, are for the story. And one of the things about Uther is he is a great war leader. Yeah. Um, and that, again, is very firmly established in the tradition. And, I mean, you mentioned the sort of historical basis. I have studied history formally and informally for 40 years now. And I've studied a lot of military history um, because I've been writing sword and sorcery and epic fantasy, but also just because I'm very interested, interested yeah. in it. And... Great military leaders have various qualities that frequently do not make them very nice people. Definitely. Um, and so that was one of the things that I drew on um, for creating Uther as a sort of a fully rounded, fully believable um, character. Because one of the thing, one of the big challenges about writing anything Arthurian is you we're dealing with a lot of archetypes here but you absolutely cannot let them slide back into stereotypes. Yeah. They've got to be fully rounded, fully convincing, you know, genuine human beings. Yeah. I, I, you nail it with you there. He's like, you say he's very masculine, sort of, he's that typical war leader. He's impatient. He just wants things done immediately, but he's also quite insecure. I get the sense that he, he sort of relies on mail and for an awful lot of things. Well, um, I mean, it's classic, if you're going to shoot at the king, you better not miss. <laughs> yeah. um, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. There are, you know, pick pick your famous quotation. Yeah. So I think since we touched on the characters, that's a good sort of place to sort of dive into. Yeah. Um, really love Nimue. I, I think I mentioned this again. <laughs> you, you, she's such a, a brilliant person to follow. Can you give us a bit of an insight into your character creation process or if you have one um, at all, if you just sort of create the character and get to know them as the story goes on? They they need a drive. They need uh, you know, a motivation. They also need horizontal relationships. They're going to be influenced by the people around them, the people who are important to them, their loyalties, their rivalries, um, people they dislike, uh, as we all are. They, people don't have to necessarily be sympathetic. Um, we are all very uh, mixed people. Um, you know, we all have good, bad, um, less admirable qualities, even if we don't particularly want to admit them to ourselves, other than le- unless we're quite, <laughs> quite on our own and nobody else is going to see. And people's actions and reactions drive a plot. Um, a plot then will drive further actions and reactions it's a cyclical process really i don't tend to sort of start with a character and yeah, you know, i will have a framework for a character i will know who a character is i will know where they've come from i will know what they want to achieve in this particular scenario and yeah. then as the scenario develops their actions and reactions are going to subtly influence who they are people they encounter things they encounter challenges they encounter are going to uh, inform the development of the character through the book. And that can sometimes take some quite unexpected twists and turns. I mean, um, this book, The Cleaving, is my 24th published novel. Mm -hmm. And I've had instances in the previous things I've written where I've got sort of halfway through a book and I've had a very firm, firmly uh, plotted out character arc for a particular character. And something will happen. And I will realise that the response I had intended for them just is not going to work. It's not going to ring true Yeah. when you look back at everything that's brought this, them to this point. Because actually, they're going to do something completely different, Yeah. which is going to have knock-on effects for all sorts of other people. So character development for me is uh, an ongoing process through the course of a book. Yeah. Um, and I would say that that is as much tr- as, as true in the cleaving as anything else and one of the things that one of the challenges that i saw lying lurking in the long grass as i started writing this book was how i was going to write guinevere because guinevere is the archetypal damsel in distress demure maiden who inexplicably commits adultery which is a bit sort of excuse me yeah. um quite often does not sit well in in the retellings and back in the day when I was a bookseller, this would have been the ooh, early 90s, there was a flurry of quasi-historical romance fantasies 
featuring assorted half-baked Guinevere's. And <laughs> they were w- so wet you could wring her out. <laughs> um, and also writing a good girl is very, very difficult. Yeah. But by the time I reached that point in the book, Arthur's character had developed, Morgana's character had developed, Nimue's character had developed based on her experiences to this point. You put the character of Guinevere into that mix and then how Guinevere is, Guinevere is going to act and react reveals her character. And actually, I found her a much more interesting character to write than I had necessarily expected to be the case. Oh, nice. I look forward to getting to that part. So. Yeah. Yeah, nice. So it sounds like characters do play a, a big part in, in the way you tell your stories. Then, mm. do, do you place any weight on other elements like theme or the plot itself? When, when I'm teaching creative writing... Um, I s- baffle people by putting up a, well, you know, back in the day, it was an overhead projector slide these days, <laughs> point, um, of a three-legged stool. Because the great thing about a three, three-legged three stool is it's stable on any surface as long as the legs are all the same length. Yes. And as far as I'm concerned, the things that make a plot, uh, rather a novel, stable and secure are plot, character and world building as long as they are all have equal weight in the story. Yeah. Because you have to have plot. Things have to happen. You have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you also have to have unexpected twists. You need to have new perspectives. Anyone can write a swords and sorcery story if all you're doing is recycling things that anyone else has done before. Many, yeah. many years ago, this would have been about 1996, 95, 96, I went to a crime and mystery fiction conference and there was a talk given by a commissioning editor for one of the big publishing houses who ran their crime list and she was explaining that what they are always looking for is the same but different (laughs) because they want a book that they can promote as like pick any name of any great crime writer but It's got to bring something new to the party. And so you've got to have twists. You've got to have a new perspective on um, a classic theme or classic idea, a classic, if it's a crime novel, a classic heist. Or in the case of my first novel with The Thief's Gamble, I had written the definitive blockbuster fantasy masterwork um, Mm. in my early 20s, which had gone the rounds of agents and editors. And this was in the days where you you were talking about, uh, you know, massive chunk of typescript going back and forth in the post. Um, And it would come thudding back onto my doormat (laughs) with letter to the effect of, well, one of the, I think possibly the most plain speaking one was the editor who said, there's nothing to distinguish this from the six perfectly competent fantasy novels that have crossed my desk this week. Yeah. Oh. And the, what, I was going to get nowhere as long as I was continually tinkering and rewriting and fussing about with that. Yeah. And so, but what got me published, the book that I wrote that got published was when I, because I read a lot of crime fiction. And in the 90s, we were starting to get the independently minded female private eye come to the fore. Kinsey Mulhone, Kate Brannigan, V.I. Wachowski. All of those were coming through in the genre. And I thought, how would a character like that fit into a classic high fantasy world? A woman who is living on her own wits, on her own terms, who is not defined by her relationships with men. And that started me thinking and that led me to the Thieves' Gamble because it was a straight down the line core epic fantasy novel, but different. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I that's gone brilliant. off at something yeah. of a tangent there, but anyway. No, no, it's brilliant. It's, I, I just <laughs> oh, love yeah. hearing about like the process. Uh, uh, yeah. you, you go through things, yeah. And so I, you know, I had a plot, and the plot informed the character, and the world informed the character, and the world informed the plot, and it becomes a circular. It becomes a virtuous spiral. Yeah. Oh, and it's actually one of the really fun things about writing, because yeah, you will suddenly see connections and prompts and something that you will have you know sketched in in the third chapter 
suddenly in the 18th chapter you think oh wow I can yeah use that. that's brilliant and <laughs> you go back in the rewrites and just shine it a little bit so that people will think you're in fact a genius <laughs> um yeah. i don't write with a theme in mind because there are very few things as dull as books that preach yeah um thing. again when i worked in book selling uh, <laughs> at one point i was in charge of the children's section because i was the member of staff for that children yeah. and i was the nominated bookseller of the area on judging or selecting the six kids books for the summer promotion well we had sort of six for sort of primary schoolers and six for secondary schoolers and we, so we yeah we we got sent all the books which we sort of sat down and read and it be soon became very apparent that the morally improving stories that were going to tell children it's nice to share your sweeties because henry hippopotamus learns that lesson they were <laughs> dull yeah the one where there was a magic lighthouse and if there was a fog strange things would wash up on the beach and these kids were on holiday now that was a cracking book yeah um it was really really good and it had themes and yeah bits of things to think about and all the rest of it just in the subtext yeah. but that's you know all there was and what i tend to find actually is that the themes of a book emerge through the course of writing it yeah uh, i'm one of these people i do a lot of advanced planning i do a first draft and then i do a final draft and generally by the time i get to the end of the first draft i will have realized what the underlying themes are yeah. in this particular book and i will have realized the points where actually i am beating the reader over the head with them and that really does need dialing back and i will also spot other places where that can be just refined tweaked maybe a little bit extra added and that is one of the points for me of doing this the second the final draft yeah um, and then it goes off to for editorial and fresh eyes invariably show me something i didn't realize and ways to improve the book even more yeah that's a cracking process and I, is that something that you just learned and sort of developed um sort of come to understand that that was the most effective for you did that take time yeah. to, to learn that um, I mean, I don't know any two writers who work in exactly the same way. Yeah, definitely. There yeah. is a, it's very much a case of uh, finding your own process and finding the best process for you. There's a broad spectrum with people who do a lot of advanced planning at one end and the people who type chapter one and go at yeah. the other end. Um, <laughs> in a lot of ways, the way I plan my novels is very much like the way I used to plan my essays at university. Yeah. Um, I would have, you know, I would structure my argument. I would go and assemble all the bits of uh, information I needed to uh, support my argument. And then I would write my essay. Um, and so, yeah, I will structure my plot. I will assemble all the bits and pieces I need to support my plot, which will also involve going away and doing some research and finding out exactly you know, what the whys and wherefores are about a particular thing. Um, and then I will write in, you know, rather than essay, I'll write my first draft. Um, books are more complicated than university essays, and you do need yeah. more than one draft, I find. But, yeah, um, yeah that's, that's always been the way I've worked, and it works for me. I think one of the most important things about uh, a writing process, one of the other things um, about that people find interesting about me is I've studied a martial art for, well, since 1983. Oh, nice. Um <laughs> And it's a martial art called Aikido, which is about uh, movement and balance and leverage and all sorts of interesting things. Yeah. And I am five foot six. Um, I am now, well, year after next, I will be 60. Um, I have never been a strapping six foot muscular young man, which means <laughs> the way I do Aikido is very different so, so the principles yeah. are the same, the underlying principles are the same, the names of the techniques are the same, but the precise way that I will execute a particular technique will be very different to the way a strapping six foot muscular young man 40 years younger than me, he will do the same technique, but differently. Yeah. He will then discover that he can't move me and I can put him flat on his face. <laughs> that's a different point of conversation. 
Um, so, <laughs> and if I go to, uh, I'm a, I go to see a guest instructor or I'm at a course, I will see a whole different variety of styles of Aikido demonstrated. And I look at that and I try it and I try and I take from everything I'm shown, I take what works for me personally. Yeah. And I, exactly the same applies for writing. I'm always interested to hear about other people's process. I'm always interested to hear other writers speak, you know, read magazine articles, all the rest of it. And I take what works for me. And I look at some things and think, yeah, that's never going to work for me in a million years, but it works for them. It's great. Yeah. No, that's it's a great way to look at it. And that's the exact same reason as why I have brilliant authors like yourself on just to ask them about their process because one thing that you've just said there might just be the missing piece in the puzzle for someone else to go off and try it and then they just nail their process and that's why I love like you say just speaking to people about how they do things and and you learn so much from other people don't you especially people who've, who've been through all the hardships and the ups and downs of writing as well yeah I mean, <laughs> there are lots of ups and downs there, there are two aspects uh a writing career there's the craft side and people sort of say oh you can't teach talent no but you can teach craft um, and I can't remember who I heard say this this was many years ago uh, a, a writer uh, at a, a conference said talent without craft is like rocket fuel without an engine it might burn brightly but it's going nowhere <laughs> yeah. and Craft is important and you can learn craft and you can improve craft and craft changes. Uh, yeah, my, my writing process has changed. As I say, I uh, wrote the first draft of The Thief's Gamble in 1996, wrote it through until 96, 97. So basically, I've been at this 25 years. My process has changed and developed and matured in the same way that I have. You know, I've got 25 years more life experience. So, yeah, it's basically... There are, I have gravely mistrust anyone who says, here is the way to do it. Yeah. No. Um, so there's two sides to it. There's the craft side and then there's the business side. And if you want to make a career out of writing, then you also have to be very clued up on the business side. Um, and I always have been. But again, I think that helps. Before I started writing full time, I worked in personnel management. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the things I dealt with was contract law. Oh, nice. So the nice first time. Thrilling. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Or how not to end up at an industrial tribunal. Yeah. And one of the things that I did when I got my first contract was two things. Firstly, I went through it with a fine tooth comb and worked out which clauses I was prepared to accept, which clauses I was not prepared to accept, and which clauses I went check wanted changing. Then I contacted the Society of Authors. And I'm actually on the management committee of the Society of Authors at the moment. I stood for an election year before last. Oh, cool. And they advise on the business side. Yeah. And you know, so we sent back a letter saying, yes, here, thank you for your contract you have sent me. I would like to change this. I will not be accepting that. And can we please add these clauses? Which apparently a lot of beginning debut novelists do not do. Yeah. But so being aware of the business side, keeping up to date with things like uh, Writer Beware is a fantastic resource. It's um, a website under the auspices of SUFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America. And Victoria Strauss just does an absolutely superb job highlighting scams and dodgy contracts and dubious clauses and all the rest of it. So we have yeah. the Society of Authors, we have the Writers Guild of Great Britain. And there's a lot of business information out there. And you also need to make sure that any advice you're reading is absolutely up to date. Yeah. Because when I started out, the business model was that you would write your novel, you would write maybe one and a bit novels a year, they would go into bookshops, you would earn out your advance, you would start getting royalties. And if, you know, if your books were good enough, if you developed, found a readership, if you, you know, developed, um, yeah, if everything proceeded as you and your publisher hoped, by about book six, you between advances and royalties and foreign rights, you know, you would be bringing in sufficient income that you would, you know, with a bit of good luck and a following wind, be able to think about giving up the day job. Yeah. 
I still see magazine articles, you know, how to write novels for fun and profit. Yeah. That assume that's still how it works. And that business model is dead as the dodo. Yeah. Um, that is not how things work. That is not how things have worked for years. But I still see articles giving that advice yeah. to would-be writers. So you have to know that your advice is up to date. We are incredibly fortunate in science fiction and fantasy that and horror that we have the convention circuit. Yeah. We have the likes of Eastcon and Kimura and FantasyCon and you know, all Bristol Con. They've got yeah, you know, I could list them endlessly, um, which are an absolutely excellent source of keeping current with the state of the market the state of the business the state of publishing because it is it has changed out of all recognition for i start since i started and it yeah. continues to change and evolve and for everything that um i look back on and think oh why don't we still have the netbook agreement there were these days there are something new where you're thinking oh wow that's a great opportunity digital downloads have absolutely transformed the audiobook sector yeah. you know that is incredible direct um you know direct writer to reader ebook sales have transformed what a writer can do with their backlist you yeah. know so basically there are all sorts of opportunities out there but you need to know you need to have current information if you're going to manage the business side yeah successfully to sustain a career uh, it's it's so important i think I'm so happy that you brought that up because when I went to my first fantasy con, I think it was back in 2020 in Birmingham, I think it came in on a Friday night and um, you were on a panel talking about this exact same thing and how the industry has changed and you spoke so brilliantly about it and you, you said a lot of the same things just then. So thank you very much for that. Um, but yeah, you, you make it, you make a great point that it's, it is a business and I think, I'm someone who's really sort of keen to get to that point where I'm making a living from me writing. And one step that I took was to sit down and do a business plan and yeah. work out where where the money is coming from and what what where you can get the cash flow from. Mm-hmm. Like something I learned, and uh, it might be different for you because you sell a lot more books than me. But the royalties probably not the most uh, the, the the thing to rely on out of anything because the profit margins are so slim it depends what publishers you're working with i mean yeah. last year i did one of these sort of you know income surveys for i think it was alcs and the biggest problem with that was it sort of said you know please answer these questions about you know your current project and i thought i've got five projects on the go yeah and all of them are contracts with different um clauses different conditions different payment rates all the rest of it mm. um you don't have to write to with a name to making a business from it i think one of the things that um is always important if knowing what you're aiming to get out of writing you yeah. want to make a living from it brilliant go for it if you did if you think you are going to get fame and fortune in the next 18 months, you're better off buying a lottery ticket. It's a lot of <laughs> very hard work. Yeah. Very rewarding. It's great fun. It's fine not to write to make a living from it. It is fine to write to explore interesting ideas. It is fine to write to explore ideas you've encountered in a book that you would like to take in a different way that have sparked your imagination. It's fine to write for the simple pleasure of improving a craft skill yeah it's fine to write because writing brings you into contact with other people and you make new friends and you go to conventions and you go to writers groups and it's all great fun and you enjoy yourself all of those are absolutely valid reasons to write if you want to write to make a living you're almost certainly these days going to need a day job for a long time um if not always and you know when i first started out people would say because i had small children at the time people say what does your husband do to support your writing career and i would say he pays the mortgage and people would go oh because yeah really yes actually really because um my writing income has always we've always had a deal the two of us and when you know when i started writing it was very much an agreement between us that i would do my best 
while kids was because uh, I I was at the sort of salary level where if I'd gone back to work after having kids, every penny I earned would have gone on childcare, and that struck us as a bit pointless. Yeah, and I was able to be an at home mum because, and this is possibly the most fantastical and unbelievable thing you'll hear this evening. We could run our mortgage on one salary. <laughs> this yeah. was the early nineties, and we had bought a small house in the early eighties. Yeah. So <laughs> our our deal was. I would give it my best shot until the kids started school, at which point the childcare costs equation changed. And if nothing comes, I go back to work. By then I had two books in print and a contract for three more. Ah, brilliant. Um, but we've always worked on the theory that my husband's income pays the bread and butter bills. And my writing income is the jam budget. Yeah. And there have been periods where the jam budget has refitted the kitchen or refitted yeah. the room or taking us on a really nice holiday to paris or other things and there have been years when the jam budget has been absolutely next to nothing so you know my accountant of incidentally i've (laughs) i've had periods where i've worked without an agent i've never not had an accountant yeah um tax man comes call yeah my accountant tells me the Technical term for a writer's income is lumpy. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, writers I know who uh, it is, it is always ups and downs. It is always ups and downs. And if you are embarking on looking for a long term writing career, you have to bear that in mind. You know, when the sun is shining, you make hay and you put plenty of hay in the barn because the cold winds of winter will come soon enough. Yeah. Definitely. So I, don't know, I think, like you say, snapping point. <laughs> I think, like you say, there, it's it's so important not to lose sight of why you do it because it's it's something that a lot of people love to do. I I personally, it's something that makes me happy, and I just yeah. want to do this every day. And if I can make money from it, that's like a dream come true. So yeah. I, I'm just trying to work towards achieving that dream. But I know it can be tough, and there's a lot of low points. And you've just got to remember why you do it. And it's because it makes you happy and you love creating things. And, and I think these that's... days as well. Um, I mean, I started off with a contract with one of the big lists, one of the mass market publishers, because that was the best way, the, do- the doable way of doing it in the late 90s. So much has changed that um, I think some of the, yeah, it is incredibly challenging to get uh, picked up by one of the big lists at the moment for a whole lot, lot of reasons. But the proliferation of ebooks and print on really good quality print on demand and you know the whole internet culture that's developed means we have an a absolutely superb small press sector. Yeah. And uh, anyone looking to get a start, I would recommend very seriously looking at the small presses that deal with what your particular interest is Um, and following that route because you will learn a huge amount and small presses frequently have the time the commitment and the leeway to devote to new developing writers developing um, new writers skills that somebody under a lot of pressure in a london office working for a multi-million you know, multinational conglomerate run by people who run spreadsheets yeah they will not have that leeway yeah it's a great point you make there yeah um i i always say look at them options as well like the small and indie presses offer because like you say they've got they might not have the marketing budget but they've got the time and efforts um or the time and the ability um to help you improve your crafts so yeah. And, and that's what you want to start analysis, isn't let's it? Let's not forget short stories. I mean, yeah. I started out writing a novel because I am not, my natural length is novels. Yeah. Um, I had to learn to write short stories by basically working out how they weren't novels. Yeah, um, I, that's what I always struggle with. <laughs> if, you, if you can tell me how that, how that works. <laughs> well, when I still get people, you know, people still look at some of my short stories and say, yeah, but this reads like the introduction to a novel. Where's the <laughs> um, which is absolutely valid. Yeah. Um, yeah, we again, we are so fortunate in the genre, uh, science fiction, fantasy genre, horror as well. Yeah, we have magazines, we have short story markets. 
um, whether that's, oh yeah, there's magazines, there's Parsec, there's Interzone, there's yeah, various other ones because clearly my mind has gone blank. We also have publishers like ZNB over in the States who do themed anthologies, um, which are I've written for quite a few of those. They're great fun to write for. They're great fun to read. Yeah. And they always have a certain amount of slots reserved for debut writers. So, yeah, if your natural length is the short story, go for it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, that can be a route into developing your craft, honing your skills, getting to the point where you are confident about trying something longer form. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And something uh, I like to use what short stories for is for world building. And this, uh, I wanted to bring it back to world building as well, because you mentioned before, um, one of the legs of your stools is, mm. is the world. So, um, like, I, I like exploring or sort of different parts of the world or different characters that you sort of might feature in a novel in short stories. So, uh, yeah. have you ever done that with any of your I have. Um, there is a collection uh, that, uh, published by Wizards Tower Press, which um, I the name escapes me completely. It's basically, I think, Tales from the River Kingdom, something like that. The River Kingdom is a new fantasy um, milieu scenario setting that I have been exploring in short stories for some some quite some years now. Nice. Um, I've written a couple of novellas set in that world. I've written a whole lot of short stories. Um, I have a novel written. It's not yet been to a publisher. Um, but yes, uh, that's one of the ways that I explored a, a world you know, way that I explored the world building. Um, nice. Yeah, it's, it's a, a perfectly valid way to do it. Yeah. And what about your approach to world building then? Is it, um, obviously it's it's something that you devote a lot of time to by the sounds of it. It helps, I think, that I did a lot of tabletop gaming. Nice. Uh, back in the day, back in my university days, I... Uh, um, did a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, and I very rapidly became the DM. <laughs> yeah. So I was the person putting together the world and putting together, together the plot. And one of the things I learned when I started writing is what makes a good tabletop scenario and what makes a good novel are very different things. Yeah. But when it comes to world building, um, actually, that's quite a good training because um, you have to be prepared for, well, certainly with the people I was gaming with, for them to go completely off the track you had planned for them. <laughs> you, know, you would you would set them up in and give them all sorts of hints that you know you want to go and explore this town. And they would come up with some absolutely undeniable reason to go 180 degrees in the other direction. So actually having a good, solid, well uh underpinned setting yeah. um does make DMing for characters who can be players who can be relied on to do absolutely the unexpected thing doesn't make that easier um one of the and i have i have read an awful lot of fantasy fiction i had i started i learned to read when i was three not because i was any sort of child prodigy but my older brother is two years older than me yeah so he started school of an evening he would be sat on the city in the lounge with my mum doing his you know ladybird key readers scheme whatever it was called mm -hmm. And I will be sitting on her other side looking at the book and the pictures. And that's how I learned to read. Nice. And I have been reading fantasy fiction and historical fiction and myth and history ever since. So one of the things that I personally hate in fantasy fiction yeah. is when I I'm halfway through a book and I suddenly realise, oh, my giddy aunt, this is feudal china with different hats on <laughs> and somebody has taken a historical setting and basically just appropriated it wholesale without thinking it through yeah. because it's a bit like trying to wear the wrong size shoes or you know put fix fix somebody into a shirt that's either too long or too you know the sleeves aren't quite right they've got to roll the cuffs up you know the collar's too tight whatever as a fantasy setting for me it has to it has to be unique it has to be distinctive i draw on all sorts of historical influences yeah and 
one of my absolute aims is that people are not going to be able to point to anything in any of my history uh, fantasy settings and say ah you got that from this place yeah and i was really really pleased quite recently actually i was talking to somebody about um my older russian compass books and we were discussing the swords and the the style of sword play and they're described as single-edged curved blades and a technical question came up and I had to explain, well, actually, it's because that's the style of sword of play I know how to do personally because it's Japanese and it's something I've learned through Aikido. And somebody said, oh, so so these swords are there sort of like katana. Well, yes, essentially. Oh, I didn't oh, no, I didn't pick them like that. I thought it was sort of like scimitar, Arabian Knights and this, that and the other. Did you? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> but the reason he thought that was he had clearly picked up on the elements of that culture that yeah. I had drawn from looking at Persian history and medieval Islamic sub-Saharan cultures. And that's clearly how sort of subliminally he picked up on various of those aspects, which had informed the picture he'd made of the, in his own head of the swords. Yeah. So, yeah, fantasy settings need to be, they need to have depth and they need to have breadth and they need to be unique to you. Wherever you get your influences from, there is a wealth of excellent material out there in terms of you know cultural history and social history but basically make it your own yeah i think we had a uh, adrian tchaikovsky on the show um a few months ago and he said one thing that simple thing that really helps to s- spin that sort of influence is just to ask what if yeah oh and- yeah and then you just go down rabbit holes. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the really interesting things I've done um, recently. Um, I must stop turning away from the microphone to look at my bookcases. <laughs> um, Adrian wrote the first novel, Redemption's Blade, in the after the war setting, and then Justina Robson, who was another superb writer, wrote a second one called Salvation's Fire, and then. Me, Adrian, Frida Warrington and K.T. Davis, that's K, full stop, T, full stop, not K.T. We each wrote novellas uh, set in the same world. And that was absolutely fascinating to do. That's called The Tales of Cat and Fisher, The Art of Steel. Um, And that was great fun to do because we were all, as it were, world building together. Yeah even though we weren't actually collaborating on the stories, we were all writing our stories independently, but we were building on what had been um, already established, seeing areas where we could invent new uh, and interesting twists and we could pick up on something somebody had mentioned completely in passing and actually work something much more detailed and fully developed for the purposes of our own story from that great fun to do uh shared world stuff is uh really interesting it's a bit like intellectual property work um work for hire i've done a uh, story for warhammer i've done a couple of things for um doctor Who and torchwood and things like that it's not nice. something i do a great deal of because it is very demanding anyone who thinks tie-in work is money for old rope oh think again a lot of research it is this very very skilled craft yeah um but it's really interesting to do to find originality within an inventiveness within a set of constraints it's a really interesting writing challenge i've done a couple of shared world shared world projects it's really good fun to do and really interesting yeah I, my first novel was actually a shared universe and i found it challenging at first but like I say, it was, it was more fun collaborating with other people and then drawing upon references from their stories and then, mm. like I say, weaving it all together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Real. Um, um, do you still encounter any challenges when you write your stories? Yes. I, I have to say these days most of the challenges I face are on the business side rather than the writing side. On the writing side, I'm, I, I am a planner. I am much less of a rigid planner than I was 25 years ago. These days, yeah, 25 years ago, absolutely every single, you know, the story was broken down into chapters, into subchapters, almost into scenes. You know, some places I would have literally the beats of the dialogue mapped out. And these days I will have the main structure 
of the story mapped out. But I'm much more fluid, much more open uh, about how yeah you know, I'll, I'll know I'm going from A to C to E. Yeah. I'll have an idea about B, and I will be fa- fairly confident by the time I get to D, I will know what I need. Um, I couldn't have done that 25 years ago. I would have just crashed and burned horribly. Um, <laughs> these days, I, you know, as I say, the cleaving coming out uh, next month, it's my 24th published novel. I've written novellas. I have written, yeah, I couldn't tell you how many short stories I've written um, in between times. Yeah. So I, I, I can trust my own subconscious process to come up with goods when I need them. Yeah. Most of the time. Um, <laughs> I have to say one of the, I probably the, uh, when I was writing The Cleaving, I, I, you know, we know how it ends. Yeah. But that had, I also knew that had to be more than a field of bloody slaughter at the Battle of Camlan. Yeah. You know, with all due respect to John Borman, it makes a great <laughs> cinema. It does not make for a great novel. Yeah. And so I was writing and I was, yeah, and the, by the time I get there, I'll know how that's going to work. And I got closer and closer and closer and closer and I was thinking, I really hope by the time I get there, I know how it's going <laughs> to work. And then considerably later in the process than I had anticipated, it all clicked into place. Oh, nice. I looked at it. I thought, "Wow, ha, excellent!" Yeah, which was a huge relief. Trust um, the process. So yeah, um, I think these days I have the confidence. If I come up against something where I think, "Okay, well, that's what I was in planning to do, and that is never going to work," I need to find something else. I need that character needs rethinking. That scenario needs rethinking. Okay, what do I do? Well, I have many many good writer friends who i can bounce ideas off i have many good non-writer friends who i can bounce ideas off frequently a non-writer friend just has to sit there make tea open the wine whatever and go "Mm -hmm, yeah Yeah. oh as you basically talk through an idea at them yeah um and playing squash with yourself yeah but uh, (laughs) Equally, uh, I mean, you know, my husband's not a writer. He's a mechanical design engineer. He basically designs car assembly lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's been doing that for 50 years. So he's basically the sort of man who one of the you know, major manufacturers rings at, well, the, the company he works for. They ring yeah. up and say, OK, we've got this field the size of N football pitches. We want <laughs> to put bits in this end and drive cars out of the other. How do we do that exactly? <laughs> and my husband will lead the team that says, right, well, you need this many robots. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, you need this many conveyors and this is how you do it. Yeah. So he is extremely good at logical progression. So if I've got a situation where it's, well, you know, OK, I've got these people here and I've got them there and I need to get them to that. And I'll lay out the problem for him. Uh, and again, you know, one of the reasons we've been together for when did we get yeah we got together in 1985 so that's quite a long time ago yeah um because we shared a love of fantasy and science fiction and the same music and same films all the rest of it so he's very clued up about science fiction and fantasy even though he's not a writer so he's great for saying well what if they did that yeah and that frequently will be the answer that i need fresh eyes are absolutely invaluable whether it's in the breaking the beats of the story whether it's uh, in the editorial process, you know, if it's feedback, if you're writing something that is a way away from your own direct personal lived experience, yeah, get fresh eyes on what you're writing from somebody who is a lot closer to that reality than you are. It's yeah, people call it sensitivity reading. Mm, unfortunately, that tends to get interpreted as over sensitivity reading. Yeah, it's not. It's actually getting informed input from somebody who knows a lot more about a situation than you do. Yeah, um, fresh eyes always always improve a piece of work. Nice. Well, since we're discussing advice, I think last question, good one. I always like to finish on is what advice would you give to anyone thinking about giving writing a go? Have a good long think about what you want to get out of it. I uh, we we covered this earlier. If you're yeah. looking for instant fame and fortune. Buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> you know, decide what what the return is that you are looking for. 
um, whether it's yeah, it's pure simple enjoyment, whether you're writing for yourself, what, you know, writing for uh, to improve a skill. Think about what you're going to get out of it, because it's got to be rewarding on a level other than just money. Yeah. If you are exactly. only writing for the money, it will get very boring very fast, both for you and for anyone who tries to read what you're putting out. Yeah. It's only worth doing if you're enjoying it. Brilliant bit of advice, yeah. Nice and simple. <laughs> Julia, thank you so much. It's been Morning. a really fascinating discussion. I've learned an awful lot, and uh, I'm hope I'm sure people listening at home have learned a lot too. No, you're absolutely entirely welcome. One of the reasons I'm always happy to have this sort of conversation is when I started out, the first real writer I ever met was Anne McCaffrey when I was an undergraduate in Oxford, and she was doing the promo tour for Moretta, Dragon Lady of Pern. And she talked to us about being a writer, about the business and the craft. That's one of the things I learned from her. Yeah. Um, over the years, I have heard so many great writers share advice, experiences, cautionary tales, funny stories, um, both, you know, talking to an audience, but just over dinner tables, yeah, con yeah. conventions, conferences or whatever. And, yeah, I have learned so much. I have benefited so much from that process myself. I continue to benefit from it. That yeah, it's um, always uh, an absolute pleasure to basically pay it forward. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. And it's, it's great to have uh, writers like yourself who, who have that philosophy and like learn something and pass it on. It's, it's, it's great, yeah. Thank you so much. I met very few writers who don't have that philosophy. I am very yeah. pleased to say. Hey, you're most entirely welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, where's the best place to look for if anyone wants to learn a bit more about you and your books? Uh, that would be my website, <laughs> uh, Uh I am still on Twitter, but oh, dearie, dearie me. Uh, <laughs> Facebook, uh, my Facebook is sort of, yeah, it's it's a public facing page. So, you know, yes, it's, a lot of it's to do with me and my friends, but, you know, anyone's welcome. I'm on Mastodon these days. Oh, nice. um, but honestly, the best place to find out uh, about me, my writing and my books will be my website and also the Wizards Tower Press website, wizardstowerpress.com, um, because they're currently publishing my Green Man books and Angry Robot yes. obviously are doing the cleaving. So, yeah, there's plenty of places to find out about me. Awesome. I'll put links in the description soon. Thank, thank you. you very much, Julia. Thank you everyone for listening. Julia, thank you so much again for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to chat with me about writing. It was a brilliant discussion. I learned a hell of a lot, as I always do, from these insightful masters of their crafts. And I hope, listening at home, you've, you've learned something new there too. Do go and check out The Cleaving. It's a fantastic book published by Angry Robot Books. It comes out on the 11th of April. So if you like anything to do with King Arthur, Merlin, and the legend as a whole, you're going to absolutely love this book. So, yeah, check it out. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe or follow so you don't miss any more. We've got another episode coming out on the 14th of April, and it's going to be the first in a two-parter on magic systems, something that we haven't really spoken much about so far, so that should be very interesting. If you enjoyed today's episode, a quick rating on the Spotify mobile app or a review on iTunes goes an awful long way. So thank you very much if you do do that. And a share with anyone you think may be interested helps us an awful lot because we don't get a lot of money to spend to promote this to the wider world. So the help we, we get, we rely on from you guys. So thank you very much. Don't forget, you can join our growing writing community by hitting the link in the description. You can find lots of wonderful people to chat about your books, your stories, coming up with ideas and getting feedback on what you've already written. Head over to Discord or Facebook to learn more there. And don't forget, you can find lots more writing-related resources on Patreon. Lots of new guides going up, some for public consumption, so you don't have to sign up to check it out. So just go over there to start reading new stuff. And if you did want to subscribe, then, yeah, you can get access to writing classes and one-to-one -one sessions with myself. Yeah, lots going on over there. So we'll be back on the 14th of April. Have a lovely few weeks and keep on scribbling.